All right, welcome. Uh, I'm Ian Jotty with the Christian Post. I'm here with um, Adam Davis and Rebecca Lynn, and we're here to discuss uh, National Police Week. Um, just real briefly, Adam is the co-author of Prayers and Promises for First Responders, and Rebecca is the author of Proud Police Wife, 90 Devotions for Women Behind the Badge. I want to thank you both for, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Great to have Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us on. Of course. Um, so first, let's, real quick, let's, let's talk about National Police Week. Um, I really wasn't aware of this before before this interview. Um, sounds like uh, you know LEOs kind of come around from around the country. They converge in our nation's capital for the week. Um, can you maybe give us a brief overview of what the what that gathering looks like and, and, and how that came about? Police Week is really about honoring the men and women who have paid the ultimate price. You know, we, we, we live in a culture where we have to have assigned days and weeks to demonstrate honor because we've gotten away from the essentials of what it means to honor those who pay the price, whether it's military or law enforcement or other uh, realms of first responders. But for this particular week, it's honoring the men and women past and present uh, who have laid their lives down behind the badge for their respective communities to remember them, to show their families that we've not forgotten and to come together and show the country what it looks like to live a life that's worthy of a sacrifice that's been paid. And um, so th those events really come together and it, it looks like organizations from all over the country. It's a massive gathering. Uh, it's, you know, it's not, you know, there, there are moments where you've got the candle, the, the candles lit and a bunch of people are gathered. It's a, a lot of folks. And it's really, it's really powerful to see those images and, and to remember uh, that nothing that happens comes without a cost. You know, Jesus paid the ultimate price for us when he gave his life for us on the cross. Mm. Uh, but there's still men and women today who lay their lives down in a battle against evil. That's what this is about. This is good versus evil. And uh, we're in a battle right now. And so National Police Week is really take time to honor those who have paid the price, honor those who continue to serve, uh, and recognize the selfless love that they demonstrate by putting on that uniform and badge every day, even when there's so much hatred shown towards them. That's great, Adam. And, and I would just add, like for this year, um, uh, the National um, Law Enforcement Memorial Fund is adding 619 names to the memorial in Washington, D.C., and 472 of those were killed um, in the line of duty last year, and then the remainder were killed in previous years, and those are all being added. So this is a time where all of those families can, you know, see their loved one's name on the wall and celebrate their life. And we can remember, we can remember those um, officers that we lost and, you know, really, you know, thank their family members as well and give support to those family members to let them know that um, the legacy of their loved one um, will not be forgotten. So, yeah, here, I mean, here we are, we're, we're in 2022 two years away from one of the roughest years on record in 2020. Um, it was so challenging for obviously so many reasons and so many people. And that was the summer um, when we really saw the mainstream media um, and a lot of even American institutions begin to really criticize, not simply scrutinize, but criticize law enforcement, yeah. uh, law enforcement policy, specifically local police departments, right? Uh, for use of force. Um, and then now recently we had FBI Christopher Ray speak about an increasing number of attacks on police officers. I'm wondering both of your thoughts on, on that, how those trends kind of dovetail and, and where we are today. Yeah, so it's been obviously the past two years, honestly, have been incredibly difficult for law enforcement and their families. Um, we've seen, you know, law enforcement officers choose to leave this profession because of that scrutiny. Um, and what's really happened is, you know, people will look at a headline from a new news media um, and kind of just regurgitate a headline and not actually learn, you know, facts regarding certain situations regarding law enforcement. But what's happened is uh, law enforcement as a whole have just been um, dehumanized. And people don't really look at law enforcement officers as actual human beings anymore. They don't see them as mothers, fathers, coaches, your neighbors. Um, 
a lot of people are just seeing them as one group of people who have ill intentions, which couldn't be further from the truth. And so it's created this just animosity, um, tension, stress, not only for law enforcement officers and their families, but within departments, within communities, because you know people who used to think they could go to law enforcement are now um, have skewed views possibly just from media headlines and things that they see. So it's created a, a ton of um, negativity that has just trickled down. I mean, we're still, while people are you know moving on with their lives, trying to get past the pandemic and, and past, um, you know, what 2020 brought with protests and riots, people kind of think that's over, but it's not over. Um, law enforcement officers and their, and their families and departments are still dealing with the kickback from, from what we've seen. Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, not, you know, listen, we, we have to address the, the reality here is, is there are organizations and groups that have a political agenda. And in order to further their agenda, they need cops out of the way. Uh, that's a sad reality, but it's a fact, okay? And, but the, the, the other fact that goes along with that hand in hand is they're not gonna stop from going after cops. They're gonna come after your families. They're gonna attack your families. And guess who's gonna be there when there's you know a, a fraction of the law enforcement presence when evil comes to your doorstep? You know, I spoke with a, a veteran law enforcement officer last year. Uh, I talked to cops all the time from all over the country. And I was talking to this one veteran officer and he told me, he said, Adam, when you get a chance to do interviews, you tell people we really appreciate them buying our meals. We really appreciate them buying our coffees. But, you know, at the end of the day, we can buy that. We need them to be our voice in town square. We need them to be louder than the voice of those who oppose us and who hate us. Mm -hmm. We need the church to stand up and to not be cowards. We need the church to be a voice of the righteous for those who are good. Uh, you can't just throw out all of law enforcement because you see one bad cop or one corrupt cop or hear one corrupt or one story of corruption or whatever the case is. You know, you wouldn't throw the church away for hearing about one corrupt case within the church. You're going to fight for it, you know? And so we need, we need men and women in the church to stand up and be the voice. You know, Revelations tells us cowards will not inherit the kingdom. In fact, it categorizes them in the same place as sexual immoral, adulterers, murderers, thieves, and liars. And so we, we, you know, we can't sit on the sideline anymore. We have to be a voice. We have to be a voice for the righteous. We have a lot of evil and hatred and animosity, just like Rebecca said, against law enforcement. And a lot of it's fed by the fuel that is fed through uh, mainstream media. And so who controls the narrative in our country? And that's the media. Uh, so you have a choice. You can be on the side of the good or the side of the evil. Which one are you going to be on? And I think it's time for the church to stand up and be that voice and say, you know what? We need good cops in our community and we're not going to stand for what the evil is trying to tear down. Excellent. Um, and then real quickly, you know, I don't want, I don't want to get too in the weeds, the numbers, but Adam, if you could maybe weigh in on what is, you know, generally nationwide, uh, what do retention recruiting numbers look like? Are people, do, is there trends of, you know, uh, recruitment numbers relatively stable or do, are more people leaving? What do, what do you see developing? Well, I, I have the privilege and honor of talking to, um, to law enforcement leadership in different parts of the country. And recruiting is still a challenge. You know, you have a lot of agencies that have up the pay, you know, up the starting pay or base salaries. Um, uh, base hourly pay and benefits and they've improved that and uh, they work on culture but at the end of the day uh, we have to raise a generation of of men and women who are willing to stand against evil and we can't feed them a narrative that says you're not going to do that because we're afraid of evil we have to raise a courageous generation so I think a lot of agencies are still dealing sort of with that issue of recruitment uh, retention uh, a lot of that is, you know, some folks moving from one agency to another. I don't have solid numbers on on people actually leaving law enforcement for another occupation, uh, but I knew there's I know there are still challenges as it as it pertains to recruiting uh, new officers. Uh, it's improved, but it's it's still an issue. Yeah, um, Rebecca, uh, want to go to your guys' books for for a minute. Um, you know, uh, reading through your, your devotional book, uh, Proud Police Wife, one of the chapters 
is uh, headlined, you know, you were born for this. And, and you kind of speak specifically to the unique challenges and the giftings that come along with being a, a police wife. I'm hoping you can maybe take us through some of those traits and, and, and what that looks like. Absolutely. So honestly, police wives are some of the strongest um, and police moms or, you know, family members are some of the strongest group of human beings I have ever met. And to know that they're often faced with um, just, it could be loneliness, it could be fear, it could be, um, you know, hatred from others. And still I see these spouses stand up and rise above and um, just be obedient to the Lord and really stand true to who they are. And when so much of the world um, can be spewing hate, these family members and these loved ones are still standing strong saying, this is what my spouse was supposed to do. This is, I'm going to support my spouse. And I have never seen a group of, yes, this is a profession, a career, but this is a lifestyle for us and, and these family members. And it's one that trickles down into our everyday life. Um, and whether it's just, you know, taking on roles as a parent more than uh, your spouse, because they're working a lot, or having to rearrange schedules or having to put in boundaries for, you know, people that might not understand the, the lifestyle that we lead. But honestly, uh, these spouses are so encouraged by the fact that their loved one wants to serve and they want to serve right alongside with them and they do. And it's just incredible to watch, to know that I've walked these shoes, but I also get to be around and talk to thousands of spouses every month and to see them all rise above the hate and rise above just the you know, trials and tribulations that law enforcement spouses can go through to just be there by their, by their side, but with their loved one and really serve alongside with them. That's great. And then, yeah, so um, Adam, uh, going through prayers and promises, the first responders, you go alphabetically through this whole, whole host of topics, uh, abandonment, yeah. courage, grace, self-control. You know, we don't typically think of our first responders pondering those kind of topics, especially out in the field. I'm just wondering how you maybe you could speak a little about the, the practical usage of these things while they're out there in the field, um, how this can kind of uh, edify them as they're on the job. Yeah, you know, Rebecca said a very key word um, in one of her first statements today, and that was uh, society has tried to dehumanize law enforcement. That started a long time ago. That hadn't just begun. That started in movies where people would cheer on the villain as they would attack cops or the cop was corrupt or whatever. This has been something that's uh, been happening for a long time. And so this is a reminder that every man and woman that puts on a uniform, puts on a badge and a duty belt, every man and woman that you see that maybe pulls you over gives you a warning or a ticket or works a wreck or responds to your worst day, they're human beings. They're human beings and they're deserving of grace. They're deserving of mercy. They have issues um, and they, they need to know that there's a place they can run to. They need to know that there's a living God who has, a, uh, who has given us the comforter in the Holy Spirit to help us, to empower us through the darkest of times in a, in a world that is growing inc increasingly evil. And so when we look at, when we look at the different topics, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman and I selected those topics based on uh, some of the challenges that the men and women of law enforcement and other first responders in particular face. They're human beings, whether they're on duty or not. I can tell you this right now, uh, some of the greatest moments of peace I have ever had in my life were in some of the most dangerous situations that you could be in. Mm -hmm. And I know the source of that peace and I'm thankful to know that peace. And so I wanted that to be available to, to everybody that, you know, really to everybody, but certainly all first responders and, and law enforcement as well. Um, they're human beings. They have emotions, they have fears, they have dreams, they have goals. You know, at the end of the day, we all have one destination and that is we're all gonna die. And that is not a super encouraging or positive quote, but it's reality. 
and how are you going to live your life? Are you going to live your life in a way that uh, that leaves a mark for for the kingdom? Or are you going to live your life in a way that leaves a mark that you lived in fear? And I can tell you certainly that men and women who serve in any capacity as a first responder, they don't live a life of fear. They live a life of faith, of courage. And that only comes by knowing the grace and the mercy of a living God, walking empowered by the power of his Holy Spirit because of a perfect sacrifice paid by the Lamb of God. And so, I, you know, I'm thankful that we were able to do this. And quite frankly, this was not one of my favorite books. I didn't want to write it when I started. But I'm thankful we did. It's had a, a tremendously positive uh, response from people across the country. Um, and even law enforcement has, you know, they picked up on it and loved it and uh, very thankful for it reaching more lives for the kingdom. Yeah, you know, what's great about it is, you know, of course, you have tons of, of believers, right, uh, you know, uh, in law enforcement. But also for those maybe men and women who are serving, who maybe don't know the Lord yet. And, and you can use this kind of to build them up. And really, yeah. at the same time, reaching for Christ, it's kind of a very oh, combination. Oh, man. Listen, <laughs> listen, that is, I love reaching and encouraging fellow believers. Uh, but my first book that Broad Street Publishing Group put out was called Behind the Badges, Daily Devotion for Law Enforcement. I only mention it to say this. There are men and women who work in law enforcement that have never stepped foot inside a church, maybe with the exception of responding to a burglar call or other call for service on duty, but they read behind the badge every day. I know, I personally know men and women who have never read the Bible, but they read behind the badge every day. And guess what? It's leading them to a relationship with, with a living savior. It's leading them to a knowledge of Jesus. And, and I don't have to preach because his word lives. And I, last year, or I'm sorry, during 2020, there was a department that was, uh, there was having, a lot of departments were having issues with riots, but this one, one particular department said, it's like you wrote this book today for us. Like it's written for today. And I said, I can't take credit for that. That's the power of his word. It's alive, it's living, it's present. And uh, you know, it, it never changes. The word says he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's prayers and promises is going to do the same thing because it's based on his word, not on my story, not on my experiences, but on him. And he is the hero of all of our stories. Amen to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, well, I want to thank Adam and Rebecca both. Uh, both thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, as we head into National Police Week, uh, wish you best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.